Hello, welcome to the first episode of Bible Versus. It's a series that we're starting up that is based on taking the Bible and applying it to actual real life things, whether it's political movements, philosophies, whatever it might be. Uh, as you might have already seen from the title, we're starting in with Bible versus BLM. <laughs> this will just be part one since there are 13 points that I'm going to be going through. Uh, but yeah, we want to take the scripture and apply it to these things because that is what how God wants us to live. That's what God has given us as far as how we need to live, how we need to respond to the world around us. And uh, so I thought it'd be important to start off with something that's very going on really big in the world right now, which is BLM. So uh, I've been going through and studying some of the things that BLM believes, some of the things that they say, and we're comparing them with the scripture and to see how that adds up. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Now, in order to get this information, I did have access to a folder that uh, was a shared folder. It may not be still. I will share the link, but it may not be technically available anymore. I downloaded it myself, so I'd have access to this information. But it was a folder that contained a lot of BLM educational materials that they're providing to schools and people uh, to educate them on the BLM movement, uh, what BLM believes, and how you could support BLM if you were behind it. Uh, so that is where this information came from. So this is from the horse's mouth, as they say. This is something that they actually believe is something that they put out. Now, whether they have changed that or whether they are hiding that information beyond this point, I have no control over that. This is, as of this recording, information that comes straight from BLM and materials that they've prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and read what they have on here. This document is called their uh, Black Lives Matter Guiding Principles. So that's what I started with as far as in analyzing this movement and comparing it with the scripture to see, okay, this is what they are using as their guide, what they believe in, where, what they're actually doing. We affirm that all black lives matter. Black Lives Matter is an ideological and political intervention in a world where black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. It is an affirmation of black folks' contributions to this society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. Now, you may already have pros or cons from the statements that are there, and as I stated earlier, the whole point of this series is not for me to politically or philosophically engage with this material other than what the scripture actually says. So the scripture does not have, for example, an answer of whether uh, black lives are systematically targeted for demise or not, since that is a current world event and that is a current world status as far as if that is a thing or not. That's not something that the scripture speaks to, so it's not something I'm going to... Uh, that's not something I'm going to address in this series. And as far as their first point here, we see that their first point is diversity. It says diversity. We are committed to acknowledging, respecting, and celebrating differences and commonality. Diversity is something that's spoken of a lot today, and the scripture actually does have things to say about diversity, so we're going to look into this. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 speak about this. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Now this is a vision of the Apostle John as he's watching this. This is a vision of the Gentiles who are to be saved during the Great Tribulation. So this is speaking of end time events. But it is very interesting that it's talking about all nations, all kindreds, all people and tongues. And all these people are standing together, where? Before the throne of God. All nations and people will be joined only through Christ. So that is uh, just starting off, that is going to be kind of the key foundational concept throughout this entire, uh, as we're going through and analyzing the statements that they make here from Black Lives Matter organization, is comparing and contrasting that with the unity concept from the scriptures, which is based upon Christ. All right, so we see there in Revelation, we also have James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. James chapter 2, starting in verse number 1. We're still here talking about diversity as a concept. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. 
But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So here we see that the unifying faith of Jesus Christ makes no differentiation within the body between rich or poor. We see here, uh, here in verse number 9, if ye have respect to persons, if you treat people differently based on their station in life, based on anything outside of Christ, then you are doing sin. It says here you commit sin. You're convinced of the law as transgressors. You're actually breaking the law of God when you have respect to persons outside of Christ. All right, so we have that in James. We also have Genesis starting in chapter number one. So we're going to go all the way back. Uh, this concept of race, this concept of diversity is going to come up a lot within uh, the BLM movement and the things they talk about. James, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter one, starting in verse number 26. We're going all the way back to see when God created man, what he said about man and how he created man. Genesis chapter one, starting in verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. So that's the first thing we see about man here is that man was made in God's image. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Verse 28 says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So from these verses, we see that when God created man, he created mankind as one race from the very beginning. It doesn't say here that he made man, and he made him black, and he made him yellow, and he made him white. He made him after his image, and that's the only descriptor that we have there. Now, of course, obviously, we have lots of different quote-unquote races that are alive and well in the world today. We see people that are brown. We see people that are lighter colored. We see people that, that have a yellowish tint to their skin. We see people that even have, uh, we have very dark skin, what we, what we call black. We even see people that have almost a purple or bluish tint to their skin, depending on where you're from and your genetic background. However, all of those things are all manifests of the original type of man which was in the image of God. And God doesn't differentiate here in the scripture between the different types of mankind. He doesn't say anything about any one uh, color or race being better or worse than another. He just says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So if you are mankind, if you're a human being, you were made in the image of God. Then we have also in Romans, going back to the New Testament, in Romans chapter 12, we're still talking about this concept of diversity and seeing what does God say about diversity, what does God say about different races. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse number 9, and we'll be reading, we'll be going all the way through the end of the, the, end of the chapter, no, I'm sorry, not the end of the chapter, but through uh, verse number 21. Romans chapter 12, it will be the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse number 9. Let love be without dissimulation. I looked up that word dissimulation. I am reading from the King James. I do enjoy the King James, and I'm going to be reading from that for this series. That word dissimulation is means hypocrisy. It also means insincerity. So that's what that word means here, that love should be without dissimulation, should be without hypocrisy, without insincerity. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. These verses here, verses 9 through 16 of Romans chapter 12, really are referring to our relationships within the church, our relationships with other believers. And as mentioned earlier, the only unity we're going to see on the earth, uh, other than the fact that we may be the same type of person, we may be mankind, would be the actual, uh, the actual family, the actual unity that comes through Christ. And we'll be looking at a lot more verses about that as we go on through the series, but that is, uh, this, this section here, verses 9 through 16, is talking about that. So that's the, that's the attitude we should have as two other believers. Should be love without dissimulation, a sincere love, no, no hypocrisy going on. We should be hating that which is evil, cleaving to that which is good. We should be clinging to the good things. Be kind, affection one to another, uh, preferring one another. So this is a very uh, positive, very... Um, 
this sounds like a very enjoyable existence, right? And that's the way it is within the church, within the body of Christ, is you have all of these things with other believers. But then verse number 17 starts talking about the relationship between believers, those who are within the body of Christ, and those without, those who are not Christians or not part of the body. Starting in Romans chapter 12, verse number 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So here we see commands given to those who are of the church saying, you should be living peaceably with all those around you. Within the church, yes, but also those without the church. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. These last couple verses here are seem very relevant uh, to this this concepts and the things that we see BLM enacting today. Because it says here, Deedly beloved, avenge not yourselves. And we'll talk a little bit later about this idea of justice. Actually, that's the next point we're going to go into is this idea of restorative justice. But here, God tells the Roman church here through, uh, through the scriptures that they're not to be seeking vengeance for themselves. It says here, give place unto wrath. So set it aside. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. God claims that as his own dominion. We saw there in verse in Genesis chapter number one that man was given dominion over the earth. But here we see God claiming dominion over this concept of vengeance. Vengeance is not something for you to achieve or something for you to get for yourself. Vengeance is something that you should set aside because that is Christ's job. That is God's job to take on vengeance on your behalf. So that actually brings us right into our our next point. Uh, The next point that we have from Black Lives Matter here on their guiding principles. Point number two is restorative justice. Restorative justice is what they call it. We're committed to collectively, lovingly, and courageously working vigorously for freedom and justice for black people, and by extension, all people. As we forge our path, we intentionally build and nurture a beloved community that is bonded together through a beautiful struggle that is restorative, not depleting. And we see already here, Uh, some of the issues with Black Lives Matter as a movement is that they're seeking unity, this community they talk about, through struggle and through, uh, through the idea of being black, and that is where they see their unity with each other. Again, scripturally, we don't see unity through race or unity through anything outside of Christ as being a positive thing. Well, let's go into this idea of restorative justice because that's the point we're on, restorative justice. So the idea of justice in the scripture is very important because God is just. Uh, We see back in Genesis chapter 18. We'll go all the way back to Genesis again. And uh, this is something I was trying to emphasize as I studied through and I was picking out particular scriptures to illustrate these points is to do a broad spectrum of, okay, what does God say in the Old Testament? What does God say in the New Testament? What What did God say to his people? What did God say to the church? Because those things all show us the nature of God and show us how he wants us to relate with these concepts throughout the entire scripture. So Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse number 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So just to pause there for a moment, Abraham, if you're not familiar, it was the is the progenitor of Israel, is progenitor of the Jewish nation. And God was going to bless, in, in particular, the Jewish nation through Abraham. Now this is, I won't go into all of that right now, but this is the only uh, special or chosen race or people that we do see in the scripture physically is God's chosen people, the Israelites. And uh, without doing a whole study and going on a whole tangent on that, if you're not an Israelite, if you're not a Jew, there is not anything else in the scripture saying that you have any kind of special claim other than through Christ. All right, so seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Verse 19 of Genesis chapter number 18 says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And this is one of the earliest instances of this term, justice, in the scripture. He will do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So God here is talking about uh, the blessing that he's going to give to Abraham. He's talking about his people, but he talks about Abraham specifically as an individual. And he says of him that uh, his people, his household, his children, and himself shall keep the way of the Lord. And he makes those that comparison there of the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. So in other words, those two things are interchangeable. The way of the Lord and justice and judgment are one and the same. Those two things are connected. So in a way there, we see the contrast between this idea of restorative justice or a justice that we have established or that we come up with as human beings and the justice that comes from God, which is the way of the Lord. That is God's justice is his way. 
Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 3, gives us a little more about this. We'll go over to the book of Proverbs. Of course, as you might be familiar with, the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. And so Proverbs is a great place to start digging through and finding what does God actually think about practical living from day to day. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 3, I believe. Proverbs 21, verse number 3. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. This is an interesting verse, and again, a whole other study you could go into with uh, talking about 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 22. But basically it says here, God desires for us to do justice and judgment. So in other words, it's something that we do. We do justice, we do judgment more than sacrifice to him. And of course, this would be a big deal to the Israelites because their whole concept of relating with God was based on sacrifices. They had to give sacrifice. They had to be killing animals, using the blood as a sacrifice to please the Lord, to actually to do a recompense for sin. Of course, through Christ, he was that one sacrifice that stood for all time. And so we no longer have to do sacrifices because God gave us Christ as a sacrifice. But we see here that this idea of sacrifice and justice and judgment, they're all kind of tied together. But we see that God desires us to do justice and judgment, something that we do, that's something that we accomplish. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, going back over to the New Testament here, Romans chapter 1. And here we're going to talk about just people. Romans chapter 1 verse number 16. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now here we see that the the only distinction here is something that we see between the Jew and the Greek. These two different races, and the only distinction here is that we see that distinction. That distinction is not in Christ. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. Anyone, no matter what race you are, can believe in Christ and have salvation through him. Verse number 17 says, For therein is the righteousness, righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And here we see that all these concepts are actually tied together. The idea of being just, the idea of having unification, the idea of faith and the idea of justification for ourselves, righteousness. All of these things are tied together in and through Christ. There in verse 16, the gospel of Christ. Just people live their lives according to this faith, according to their faith in God through Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. says a little more about this. We'll go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Here we see again, Christ and this idea of just and unjust, they're all tied together. Christ hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Here we see that the justice that we should be seeking does not come from this flesh. It's not tied to anything to do with this body. The justice that we should desire, the justice that God gives us, comes through Christ. Christ also hath once suffered for sins. We are sinners. We are the unjust here. The just for the unjust. Christ is the just. We are the unjust. And Christ was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit for us, the unjust. Sinners are unjust. Justice is non-existent without Christ. We cannot have restorative justice. We cannot have any kind of justice that we want outside of Christ. True justice comes of him and through him. Romans chapter 12, going back again to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse number 19. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We touched on this verse earlier. Justice is God's domain. It's not something that we are given the authority to control or the authority to take charge of. Romans chapter 13 goes into this a little more. So this is the, the very next chapter. So here we see this idea of the Christian relating to those within the church, the Christian relating to those without the church. And then verse 13 talks a little bit more about some other things. Romans chapter 13, we'll start in verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. We've heard that term before, right? The powers that be. That's a phrase that everyone uses. But the, this is a scriptural term. The powers that be, those authorities, those governments, those people who are put over you, whether they're police, whether they're local jurisdictions, whether they're governors, presidents, whatever they are, they're ordained of God. Now, that's not something we hear spoken about very often, very often, especially in our country, because we have in, in the USA, we have the ability to elect those leaders. We feel that we chose those leaders and we feel that they are beholden to us. Now, there is based within our governmental system. That is true. They are beholden to us in the sense that we voted them in. They represent us. But if they have authority here, it says that that authority was given to them from God. The authority doesn't come from us. 
That authority comes from God himself. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, again, let me go, let me just make one thing clear. These aren't my words. These aren't my opinions. Uh, all, all I want to do through this series, all I, my, my wholehearted desire is to bring us back to the scripture and look to the scripture for our answers on these issues or these concepts that we're dealing with today. And in doing so, we're going to be seeking out what God thinks of these things, what God says about these things, not what man tells us. So what does the scripture actually say here? It says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. That sounds pretty bad. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. In other words, if you're doing the right thing, you have nothing to fear of that power. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, speaking of that authority, is the minister of God to thee for good. We often use that term minister to talk about pastors, to talk about uh, clergy, if you will, those people who are working in a church situation. But here it says in this, in this scripture, Romans chapter 13, God calls those authorities, those people who are over us in positions of authority as ministers. They are ministering the justice. They are administrating for God on his behalf. Let's go into this a little further. Do that which is good, thou shalt have praise the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So in other words, going back to uh, Romans chapter, thir chapter 12 here, a few verses earlier, where we saw avenge not yourselves. It's not our job to avenge ourselves. It's God's job to avenge any, to, do, to commit justice, to enforce that. And who does he use to do that? The minister of God to thee for good is going to be those powers that be, those authorities, those governments that God has put into place. If thou do that which is evil, be afraid. We should fear authority only in so much as we are committing wrongdoing. If you are doing right, you have nothing to fear of those authorities. He is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. We see here God manifests his own anger, his own judgment down upon evildoers through those governmental authorities. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, don't obey just because you're going to get the sword if you don't, but you should be doing so also because of your own conscience. You should be desiring to please God to do the right thing in and of itself, not just because you will be punished. Verse number six, for for this cause pay ye tribute also, and even goes in here into taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So your taxes, and, and Christ, of course, talks about this too, not the point of this study, but Christ also mentions this, that you owe tribute to uh, the authorities over you. Uh, they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So we see here that these things all flow together. We saw there in uh, chapter number 12 of Romans, these ideas of the church, these ideas of how we treat each other within the church, goes into this ideas of Christians treating those without the church. And then it also talks about right after that, in Romans chapter 13, these ideas of the Christian and how they should relate to, or the, the individual, and how you should relate to the authorities that are put over you, governmental authorities especially. So that is all that we're going to touch on then with this restorative justice. Then the third point we see here from this Black Lives Matter document, it says, unapologetically black. We are unapologetically black in our positioning. In affirming that black lives matter, we need not qualify our position. To love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a necessary prerequisite for wanting the same for others. And again, this uh, I was trying to find scriptures that touched on these concepts specifically, but I kept coming back to scriptures that were talking about race because the main thrust here that they're talking about is unapologetically black. They do not want to apologize for being black. And uh, in the scriptures, there is no division according to race. We'll go back to uh, Galatians. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter 3. And starting in verse number 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. These are the kind of phrases that we tend to brush over because we hear them so often, especially if you're in the church yourself. But listen to this again. For ye are all, so anyone who's hearing this, the children of God... You are God, part of God's family. You are his child. You are his adopted child by faith in Christ Jesus. So we are unified as one family in Christ Jesus. Verse number uh, 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And he, he takes away any argument you could have of having division between different people types or anything that we would look upon as saying, well, we are different than each other. Because he says here, if you're in Christ, you're all part of the same family. You're all unified in this family through Christ. It's not based upon your race. It's not based upon your feelings. It's not based upon whether you're male or female or even your position in your lot in life, whether you're bond or free. It's based upon Christ. Verse 29 says, if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. We talked about him earlier. Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here we see some of those promises that were given to Israel, God's chosen people, are passed on to the Christian, to the believer, because you are grafted into that family. You are Abraham's seed, not because of yourself, not because you're black or white or whatever, but because of Christ. So that's in Galatians chapter 3. Go back over to uh, Romans here. Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, and starting in verse number 9, as you can see, Romans has a lot to say about these issues. So Romans would probably be a great book to start in if you're looking to something to just read about these concepts of justice, about the concepts of division and unity in Christ. Uh, chapter number 10, and starting in verse number 9, it says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And of course, saved here is a term that we hear a lot, but saved when it's in the scriptures, when you're talking about salvation or being saved, it's being saved from your own sin. Saved from the judgment that you deserve because you broke the law of God. Verse number 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see here that this righteousness doesn't come from ourselves, but it comes from that belief in Christ. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That salvation is comes on, on behalf of that confession that we've made. Of Christ. Verse 11 says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse number 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Here he goes back again saying that these, these racial differences, these divides that you see, that you think are so important, are not as important as they may seem. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. In other words, when God looks at, um, at someone and they call out to him and they say, Christ, I, I want to be saved. It says here, uh, they believe in their heart and with the mouth they confess their sins unto, unto salvation. God does not look at them and say, well, are they black? Are they white? Uh, what are they wearing? Are they poor? Are they rich? Uh, are they male or female? He doesn't look at those things. The only deciding factor for God to give that salvation as a free gift is whether you call upon the name of the Lord. Verse number 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when that word shall there is a promise. He's saying that if you call upon the name of the Lord, it is guaranteed, it is granted unto you, regardless of who you are, where you are, what you've done, or, or what you did in the past, what you believe in the past, where you came from. None of that matters because all that matters now is whether or not you are in Christ. That's in Romans chapter number 10. Uh, so let's go over to back to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. And Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse number 9. Galatians 3 verse 9 says, So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Here we see again, our faith in Christ ties us together with Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So in other words, if you do not follow the law completely and perfectly, then you are cursed, you are damned, you are going to hell. But that no man, verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Here it all goes back again to your faith in Christ. The law is not a faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So here we see again the uni unification, the tying together, this idea of uh, being unapologetically united. The only way you can achieve that, the only way you can see that, come to fruition is in and through Christ. Not through being black, not through being white, not through uh, some kind of creed outside of Christ. The only true unification comes through Christ. Let's go over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, we're still talking about this idea of being unapologetically black and what the scripture says about this concept. Acts chapter 10, verse number 34. Acts chapter 10, verse number 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Peter here is speaking. He's, he's giving a sermon to Gentiles. It's here in the house of Cornelius. And he's talking about salvation through faith. He says, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, God is not looking at 
at your condition. He's not looking at your personage in order to determine uh, whether you are good or not. And his justice is not based upon your color, of the color of your skin or your station in life. What does he say, though? In every nation, so all races, all nations, he that feareth him. So here's what God is looking for, whether you fear him. And worketh righteousness is accepted with him. You're accepted. You're good with God if you work his righteousness by faith. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. So we see here again, it all ties back to Christ. The peace that we want, the fulfillment that we want, the unification that we want only is achievable, only comes to be through Christ. And then uh, we'll go back again to the Old Testament here and touch on Malachi chapter 2 the end of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 10 here. And again, talking again about this idea of race, we see again, it's mentioned here in the scripture, of chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, have we not all one father, have not one God created us? In other words, God as a heavenly father of creation, of making all of us, made all of us at the same time and made all of us together. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. And here, of course, he's talking to the priests. Uh, this is a message to Israel. But that principle is still true, that God, one God created all of us. We're all still mankind. God doesn't delineate between all of the different races and say that you deserve more or less or you are going to be granted more or less of his blessing based upon your race. He does it based upon your faith in Christ, as we saw from the scripture already. The fourth point we see here, and this is gonna be the last one we'll touch on in this video, is gonna be is globalism. <laughs> and uh, of course, if you're familiar with the scriptures, globalism it brings about all kinds of different concepts. I'm not going to go into all of that here, uh, but we're gonna focus in on specifically this idea of globalism as they speak about it. Uh, globalism, we see ourselves as part of the global black family and are, we are aware of the different ways we are impacted or privileged as black folk who exist in different parts of the world. This idea of globalism here, uh, it, it, we see in the scripture in John chapter 1, verse number 10. John chapter 1, starting in verse number 10. Because they mention here this idea of a global black family. Well, in John chapter 1, verse number 10, we see he was in the world, this is speaking of Christ, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. So Christ was not accepted when he came to earth. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, there we see again that idea of accepting Christ by faith, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Here we see the true unifying global family of the scripture, which is being children of God, being the family of God together, even to them that believe on his name. Verse number 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So there we see as many as received him, those are the ones, those who accept Christ by faith are the ones who become the sons of God, who have a unification and a global family in and through Christ. Outside of that, there is no global family. There is no unification. There is no globalism outside of Christ. It would all be a false hope. Let's go on to uh, 1 John chapter 3. Another writing from John here. 1 John chapter 3. Going towards the end of the book here. 1 John chapter number 3. And starting in verse number one, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. He, has, he gave us this love, that we should be called the sons of God. This is a great gift. This is a great love that God gave us to be a part of his family. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. We saw back in John chapter one, in his earlier book that, that John wrote, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that, uh, the, his, that Christ came into the world and the world knew him not. The world didn't accept him. And just like that, in the same way, if we're a part of that global family of Christ, then the world's not going to accept you the same way because you're going to be different. Verse number two, it says here, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And of course, he's speaking as end times. He's speaking of things that are to come. But he's talking again about the separation, the difference that there is in being part of the body of Christ, the family of Christ, and being outside of that, being part of the world at large. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Our only hope for unity, our only hope for purity, our only hope for perfection is in and through Christ. It's not in our race. It's not in our blood. And this also is interesting because many of the same verses you may have noticed 
also contrast this idea of a global black family, but they also contrast the idea of a global white family. Uh, you could easily take all of these same scriptures and apply them to beliefs and uh, and platitudes that are preached by the uh, the white supremacists and see that they are also in the wrong. There is no white supremacy. There's only God's supremacy. And the only way to be a part of that supremacy in God is through Christ. That's the only thing you can have that puts you above and beyond what you have in the flesh. Uh, first, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we see some more here about uh, recognizing 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which lived should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 14. Yes, sorry, I'm making sure I'm in the right chapter. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So that was the only unification we had before that, is that we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. So it's not, we're not basing that life after Christ on ourselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Our relationship with other people is not based on their flesh. Our relationship with other people is based on their spiritual condition, which, if it's in Christ, means that we are bound together if we are also in Christ. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Your identity in and of yourself, in and of your own family, your own earthly family, in and of your race, as we call it, that passes away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That idea of justice, that idea of reconciliation, of things being made right, of things being set the way they should be, can only happen in and through Christ. That's in 2 Corinthians. Let's go back to John. John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and starting in verse number 35. John chapter 18, verse 35. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? This, this scenario, just to go into this a little bit of context, I don't want to read that whole chapter, but this is when Jesus is brought before Pilate. It's toward the, ends of his, the end of his life. He's going to be crucified. And here we see Pilate talking to him and asking him questions back and forth. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Verse number 35. Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? So he's talking about this conflation of authority, how he says, if you're a Jew, then why aren't they the ones judging you? And it's interesting because Christ, as, as he very often did, takes us in a little different direction than Pilate was intending. Verse number 36 of John chapter 18. It says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. So he takes, he takes it completely out of this context. He's saying, all you're seeing is whether you're a Jew or a Roman. And he says, my kingdom is something different. My kingdom is on a different plane. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Christ highlights that his kingdom is not based on a race, it's not based on a nation, but it's based on a spiritual unity. And he was just about to go and complete that unity. He was about to make that unity possible by his death and subsequent resurrection. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 14 is where actually we're going to end for this video today. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 14. Galatians 6 verse 14 says here, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We hear talk today a lot about this idea of pride, whether it's pride of your race, pride of your country, pride of uh, your sexual orientation. People talk a lot about pride, taking pride in things, taking glory in something that is of themselves. But here, in the book of in the scriptures here, we see in the book of Galatians, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm a believer, if I'm a Christian. I should not be glorying in anything more so than Jesus Christ. I am a Christian first and foremost. I'm of that kingdom that Christ was talking about first and foremost, above all else. And, and, and we even see Christ talk about this, of this idea of if you're following after me, if you're one of my disciples, then you're able and willing to reject anything and everyone else. Any other bond, any other unity you have is forfeited when it, outside of Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me. So everything else is crucified. Everything else is dead. And I unto the world. I'm not a part of this world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. We see here that 
everything comes down to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything comes down to whether we are in Christ or outside of Christ. Uh, I'm actually going to go over to Philippians chapter 3, one more verse, one more uh, set of verses here. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 7. He says here, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Those things I thought were so important, I let them go. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. As we think about these ideas of Black Lives Matter, as we think about these ideas of our race, our position, and uh, where we are, where we stand in relationship with the world, where we stand in the relationship with ourselves, our relationship with God, first and foremost, the most important thing that we see from the scripture is that our our relationship with God through Christ is the most important thing. It needs to be settled above and beyond all else. We even saw there at the end with some of these some of these verses that we should set aside all those things and count them as dung. So often we get caught up in, 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 in saying that we love our families. And it's good to love your family. God has teaching in the scripture about how to love your family, what to do to love your family, how to treat them better. But above all other things, we should have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you don't have that relationship right, you're not going to see restorative justice. You're not going to see a global unity with other people. You're not going to see uh, the rest of the things listed here we're going to talk about in the next video. This idea of value, this affirmation, uh, empathy, families, all of these things are only possible properly in and through Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I implore you today to make that right. We've been through many scriptures. You can go back through this video. You can look at the notes, read the scripture for yourselves, and you are now accountable. That is part of the uh, my goal with this series is to make myself, but also make everyone else, everyone else who's heard this, to be accountable to God for what he has told you. The scriptures as given to us, the Holy Bible, the scriptures from God that he inspired man to write, and they are inspired by God himself, is, our, is his message to mankind. It's what he gave us. When we ask, well, what does God think? Well, how would God, what would God say about this? He gave that to us in the scriptures. We just have to go looking for it. But once you see that, once you do find it, once you hear it, whether it's through me, whether it's through your pastor, your church, whether it's through your own personal study, you're now accountable for that. You have to answer to God for the things you've heard. If you've watched this video, you're now accountable. And you need to make your decisions from now on based on that information. And as we saw earlier, if you make those decisions outside of the will of God, if you're fighting back against authority, if you're wrongdoing, as he talked about, then you will receive judgment for that. But if you are respecting other persons, not because of their race, not because of uh, what they look like, or whether they're male or female, but upon whether they believe in Christ, whether they are part of that family, well, then that is what the scripture calls us to. I hope this was an enlightening a little study. Uh, I'm enjoying it so far, and I decided to go with only the first four points off of this so that to keep this video uh, short and digestible as much as possible. Uh, if you'd like to see more videos like this, please like the, the video, please subscribe to the channel, and I, I would love for you to give me some comments if you feel that I have misquoted or misspoke in any way about the scriptures. I want to be accountable for that. Uh, if you feel that I missed anything, that there's extra that you want to add in there, please throw in if you've got references uh, from the scriptures or teachings or sermons on this kind of stuff. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to uh, get some feedback on that. Um, and if you feel that anything I said was a miss or is wrong, uh, then please show me from the scripture where it was wrong. I, I, I want to be correct according to God's word. I want to be correct according to what he wants. And so if there's anything I've said or done in this video that is not according to God's word, then please hold me accountable for that. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you watching. We appreciate you following the channel. If you feel that anyone else would like to see the content in this video, please share it. And otherwise, we'll see you in the next one when we do part two of the Bible versus BLM.